Hi, everybody. I'm Oprah, and I'm really hoping that you're getting as much from this series as I am. And I'm so happy to have here today someone who has studied uh, in the ancient Chinese religion of Taoism. And before I introduce him for a better historic understanding and context, a little Taoism 101, approximately 200 million people adhere to traditional Chinese religions, of which Taoism is considered predominant. It uh, takes its name from the word Tao, translated literally as the way. It looks like Tao, but it's really Tao. Mm -hmm. And it's based on the Tao uh, Te Ching, which was written over 2,500 years ago. And legend has it that, uh, is it Lao Tzu? Lao Tzu. It, Lao Tzu is the founder and the author of the Tao Te Ching. And it's comprised of 81 passages, 81. And according to my guest, it describes a way of living that's balanced, moral, and spiritual, and that works for all facets of life on Earth. So we're going to be talking about the Tao Te Ching today. But first, I just, I don't even know how to begin to, to introduce you because I, we were going through all the books that you have. Mm. I just say umpteen. 31. Okay. <laughs> umpteen bestsellers, <laughs> right. including The Power of Intention, which actually mm -hmm. is my all-time favorite. Mm. Do you know who it is, listeners? It's Dr. Wayne Dyer. And he is here to talk about the Tao, which is his latest book, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, Living the Wisdom of the Tao. So why the Tao? Why now? Why now mm. the Tao? Well, the Tao is uh, <clears throat> one of those things that uh, kept coming at me. It's, uh, I call it a calling. When you just keep getting sort of like synchronistic uh, uh, callings from, uh, you know, somebody would tell me about it, and then I had talked to someone who had been through uh, a very difficult time with uh, uh, addictions and, and mm -hmm. so on, and, and uh, wasn't able to do anything in the program, but was just just read the Tao, read the Tao every single day, and the only thing that uh, seemed to work for for this particular person and others, including one of my own children, who has struggled with uh, addictions herself. Was, uh, was in reading the Tao. That's interesting because, you know, uh, that whole controversy I had with James Fry, I right. don't know if you know about it. I do. But one of the, th he says that that was one of the things that also helped him, that struggling with addiction. That was the person. That was the person. James called my daughter, as a matter of fact. And, really? And was willing to do anything at all to help her. I mean, he's, uh, you know, someone that I, I have a great deal of love and respect for. Um, <clears throat> and and what he said uh, to me was that um, I wouldn't do the program, I wouldn't do the ten steps, I didn't want to substitute one kind of an addiction for another, right. but I would read the Tao. Uh -huh. And then my publisher uh, out in California uh, called me and said, you've... Uh, You've got to read this book, and you've got to do this, and 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 every time I would turn on the television or something, I, I would be some kind of reference to the Tao, and I've gotten to the point in my life and in my career where I I, I listened when these sort of uh, things that start coming at you from a distance and that you're not quite sure. That appears to be coincidences. They, they appear to be, but there there's, there's no such thing. Yeah, there's no coincidence. In fact, uh, you know, the word coincidence itself is a mathematical term. You remember in geometry they would say two angles that that coincide are said to be two angles that fit together perfectly. Mm -hmm. So now we've taken a term that means two things that fit together perfectly and interpreted it to mean uh, something that fits together accidentally, which we've just reversed the whole concept of coincidence. It's wow. coincide. So um, I called my publisher and I said, I just had an aha moment. I never heard it explained that way before. Really? Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that was great. So it's... Um, so, so the Tao kept I started, calling yeah, it you. It just kept calling me and calling at me, and uh, and and I I would read a little bit of it, and I taught at a university. I I even taught a little bit about world religions, and mm -hmm. I taught about Tao, uh, Taoism, and so on. But I really wasn't really that familiar with it. I just, and then I began to do the research on it, and most of the people who who write about the Tao say it's the wisest book ever written. It's the most translated book in the history of publishing, other than the Bible. Other than the Bible, yeah. yes. Yeah, and there are 14,000 different interpretations or, or translations that I came across myself. And so uh, <clears throat> I started, I would read the very first verse. The opening line of the Tao says, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. You can, you, you can call things something, the minute that you call something or put a label on it, then it's no longer the Tao. Yes, you know... I was wondering, I was saying this to the producer of our show, that I obviously wanted to talk to you about it, but I was thinking, do you need to be further evolved along the spiritual path before you can begin to accept or receive the concepts of the Tao? Not like, at all. You don't. Not at all. Some really? of the most common things that you say every day in your life came right out of the Tao to change. Yeah, but uh, I know the whole idea of no rules. Right. 
The journey of a thousand miles yes. begins, begins with at, one yeah. step. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, those who know don't speak. Those who speak don't know. Uh, think small rather than thinking big. Uh, all of these kinds of comments and, and things it's, ha have come out of this, this little Chinese man. I mean, Lao Tzu translates to old man. This old man that just had these uh, visions about how to go about living our lives conflict-free, mm -hmm. how to live without having any enemies, how to, uh, how to be at peace. You know what it really taught me, Oprah? Because I did, I, I did it for a whole year. It taught me to, th to think like God thinks. And that was like, that's my favorite quote from Einstein, you know, his whole idea. He said, I don't want to be consumed with the details. I'm just right. paraphrasing. He said, I just want to learn to think like God, God thinks. thinks. yes. And so how does God think? And I began to see that God thinks without force, you know, makes everything happen without any force at all. There are no, no, no one is excluded. Everyone is, is included. God does nothing but give. Mm -hmm. It's always about giving. You know, Hafiz, the great uh, poet from the 13th century, said that uh, he was talking about, uh, <clears throat> you know, just about giving. He said, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. He said, just think what a love like that does. It lights up the whole sky. It wow. lights up the whole sky. And it's just, so it's like if you can, you know, there's been so much talk about the secret, you know. Right, I know yes. you've done shows on it and, uh, you know, I was I wanted to, to talk to you that. about that. I, first of all, I wanted to ask you, do you feel somewhat validated? I just feel so grateful and so thrilled that, uh, that more, it's one of the most popular nonfiction books in the history of publishing. Over uh -huh. 10 million copies are out there. I mean, it's just... It's, it's giving people a look at the power of what happens when, we, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. I mean, the world begins to change when you change the way you look at it. I would have liked to have seen a little different emphasis myself. I think yeah. too much of it is on getting, getting rather yes. than giving. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if, you, if you have this incredible power to align yourself with a universal divine mind that is always giving and always offering, then it seems to me that's where we ought to be putting our attention. <laughs> yeah, know? actually, I was surprised when I first saw, you know, the first tape of The Secret. I was actually surprised that you weren't on there. I, that, I was asked to be. Okay, that mm. makes sense, because I thought, well, you are the, the yeah. father of all this. Yeah. So, I was, I was, And why I, did you choose not to be? I didn't want, I didn't want to be a part of that emphasis any longer. And uh -huh. that, was really, that was really my... Uh, Reason for doing Change Your Thought to mm. Change Your Life. And it was re really the result of my living the way I'm living now. Uh, the way I'm living now is on an island. It's, uh, it's in a place where uh, I can just get as much uh, validation from a tree or, or a spider or, you know, anything in nature. I mean, what Lao Tzu taught me is that God is in nature. It's, it's in, and you have to find your own nature and that in every single one of us, in every human being out there listening, we have a nature and we know what that nature is and we know what our calling is. We just haven't changed our thoughts to be in alignment with it. And this, what I want to do with this, and this is, to with me... This being change your thoughts, change your yeah, life. Yeah, this is about teaching people how, to, uh, what they should be thinking. Become more flexible. Right. Become less rule-oriented. Become more open. Don't have any enemies. This is, he, Lao Tzu was teaching all of yeah. us 2,500 yeah. years ago. Yeah. This is the way to think and to yeah. have a moral word. Yeah. Don't talk about peace, be peace. Right. Don't look to be virtuous, be virtuous. Be humble, yes. be, be yeah. peaceful, be loving, be all of these kinds of things. Be serene, be content. You know, stop trying so hard. Just sit, get back, relax, enjoy. The next thing I'm going to do is on uh, the dynamics of how to change a thought. Because most people know that what they should be thinking. Yes. They just don't really know how to go about changing the way that they think. You know, yes. it's like, because most of us, we have, what, 60,000, they say, separate thoughts every day. Yeah. 60,000. But the problem is we have the same 60,000 we had yesterday, and we're going to have the same 60,000 again tomorrow. And we just keep repeating the same thoughts. And none of us ever ask the important questions like, is what I'm thinking true? Because the thought that it's going to be difficult to do something, for example, or it's going to be complicated, or it's going to take a long time, or it's a struggle, that, that uh, usually, if you, if you really examine that, there's no truth in that whatsoever. So I'm talking to Dr. Wayne Dyer, who's really the father of uh, the spiritual movement as we know it in, in our time. A lot of people call you the father of motivation, but when I was talking to you, you weren't just a motivational speaker. Mm. You were trying 
back in 1978 when I first came. Is it 78? I thought it was 76. I used yeah. to fly up to Baltimore every time there was a... Yes, and talk theory. to you when I was doing yeah. that little show called People Are Talking with Richard Chair. And we'd start, start talking about these ideas, which really started to open me up in a mm -hmm. way that um, I'd never experienced before. How did you... What was the moment, the spiritual moment, and I use, you know, the word spiritual mm -hmm. carefully here, what was that moment that got you to see your own life differently, that opened you up? I know exactly the moment. I know the date, the time. And okay, tell it me. Was, it was uh, 1974, and um, I, I grew up in a series of foster homes and orphanages mm -hmm. and so on, as you know. Um, I had my father walked out on us. Yes. You know, he just abandoned us. He never paid any support. He just had three boys. My mother had three boys under the age of four um, before she was 23 years old. And she was just left. It was a depression. I was born in the 1940. My brothers were born in 38 and 36. And I carried around deep anger and deep resentment and deep hatred. I dreamt every rage. night. Rage was, is a yes. good word because yes. at night I would wake up and I would be sweating, and I'd be, I would meet him in a bar someplace, and I would be hitting because he was an alcoholic and uh -huh. so on. And, uh, but I never, I, I never was able to find him. I ended up in Biloxi, Mississippi, at his grave through a series of just the most bizarre circumstances. Uh, I rented a car. There that a, weren't coincidences. Yes, yes exactly. And, and I was sent. I was sent to get rid of this rage inside of me because I knew that I came here to do something great. I knew that. I, I knew that when I was a little boy. I knew I could talk kids out of being upset uh, at what was going on in the, in the orphanage, for example. They always, when everybody would show up, they'd always say, where's Wayne? Go get them. And I'd, whoever it was, a little girl would be crying, and I'd say, this is the greatest place in the world. There's no parents. You're going to love this place. And, <laughs> and that's what I would just try to take the attention off of what they were, uh, you know, their anger and their fear. And, wow. and so on. So I always knew this. So I get to my father's grave. I, I didn't even know he was dead up until up until just a few months before, and his body had been shipped there. And when I went to the grave and I stood there at his grave, I finally said, from this moment on, this was after three hours of just stomping on the ground, I said, from this moment on, I send you love. From this moment on, I will no longer have any resentment or hatred or bitterness towards you at all. I never dreamt about this man again. I feel his presence very, very frequently. From that moment on, I quit drinking. Alcohol was no longer a part of my life. I lost the weight that I was, uh, I, I changed my diet around. The right people began to show up in my life. And it was all about forgiveness, uh, Oprah. It was just about, you know, Mark Twain said that forgiveness is the fragrance, the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. And uh, I, I could, un I understood it finally. I finally got that. Say that again. Forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds. On the heel that has crushed it. Oh, it's, yeah, wow, that makes it's me want so to cry. poetic. Yeah, yeah, it's so beautiful. And I, I have never had an angry thought towards him or towards anyone else since that time. In Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, Living the Wisdom of the Tao, um, Dr. Wayne Dyer's latest book, of, I think is this 31 or 32 uh, books, bestsellers, uh, you say, For my father, Melvin Lyle Dyer, even though I've never known you, after thoroughly digesting the Tao, I finally get it, exclamation point. It is and always was all perfect. I love you. Mm. And I feel that. I feel him now. I feel him right here with us now. I can. How was it always perfect when he essentially abandoned you? How mm. was that perfect for people who are listening? We're mm. talking to Dr. Wayne Dyer about his latest book, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. And he lived for a solid year this Live the Dow every Live the day. Dow every day. How it's was perfect. it perfect? It's perfect because it taught me the most important thing that we have to learn in, our planet, in this planet. It's about forgiveness. If you don't have something to forgive, in the Course in Miracles, you know, it says if you if you if you haven't blamed, then there's no need to forgive. Yeah. So once you get rid of blame, once mm -hmm. you get rid of your your hostility, mm -hmm. so in order for me to be able to get to a place where I could teach people about how to go through their life without bitterness and anger and tension and fear and hatred and all that stuff that we carry around because of the way other people treat us, I had to go through that experience myself. Everything that we went through in our life, we had to go through in order to get to this moment. And that's why it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. It was perfect for mm -hmm. you. Right. I, 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 I feel that way too. Being born where I was born, raised the way I was raised, everything including the, the you know, sexual abuse, the poverty, all of it. Right has made this moment possible. Absolutely. And yeah. therefore, it was perfect. That's it.
It was. I mean, I remember hearing you talk a couple of years ago, and you said, but your parents had sex one time? One time. One time in their one whole time. life. One their, time. Before, their whole life. after. Their yeah. time. And you were the result of she that. She was one wearing one. a poodle skirt, and he wanted to see what was under it. He Is said. that right? Yes. She was wearing a poodle skirt. I remember skirt. those poodle skirts. <laughs> she was wearing a poodle skirt. It was wow. a pink poodle skirt, and he and said... it was under a tree or was, something? And like? he asked to take her home after school and they stopped by an oak tree i think it's why i love oak so much i just am obsessed with oak trees I don't even know what it is why i'm so drawn to them but anyway under a tree and uh he said uh he when he took her to the, to my grandmother's house her mother's home that she still had the leaves on the back of the skirt because oh, they forgot goodness. to brush all the leaves and off she was a young she was young wasn't yeah, she, she was 18 years 18 old, years old. Mm -hmm. and that one yeah. in that one now how could there be a how could that be a uh, an accident. A co an accident yeah. or a coincidence. coincidence is something that fits together perfectly. Yes. I often think about, look at all the series of things could happen. It wasn't even like they were friends. Mm. She, They happened to be passing at the same right. moment. Mm. And he said, hey, girl, mm -hmm. what if she hadn't come out of that door exactly. at that moment? Mm. You know? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. If one second later, you know. That one second later. And, and one all second. of, that's why there's, it's like, yes, there's an organizing intelligence behind this behind all, that's one of the things that I know. That's what you talk teaching. about in this oh, book. So, I mean, is the organized intelligence? Yes, and organizing it. Just think. I used to give the example of just imagine for a second a uh, a, a junk a, a junkyard. I mean, it's got three million pieces of junk, yes. just strewn every place. Everything you can think of: old toilet seats. It's got the wiring and just the old generators and batteries. And, yeah, and everything junk. that you can think of. The right. whole three million of them. A wind comes along. A two hundred mile an hour wind comes along and takes all of this junk and twirls it around and it goes up into the air and it's twirling around in the air of this, you know, this cyclone that goes by. The cyclone passes and all the junk comes back down to the ground and there's a Boeing 747 where it was just a field of energy, a field of junk before. What is the likelihood of something like that happening? What, I mean, a billion to one, a trillion to one, could it ever happen? It takes an organizing intelligence to take all of these things and bring it together and a Boeing 747 is nothing compared to a human being or compared to the universe, compared to all of those stuff. To, to think that this all is something that just happened because it was some happenstance accident, there is something called the Tao. And it says the Tao does nothing, but it leaves nothing undone. Those who are listening for the, and hearing about this for the first time, and there are a lot of people, uh, actually hearing this, this philosophy for the first time, is Tao more if more of a, is it a religion, would you say? Is it a lifestyle? <laughs> Lao Tzu. Uh, Lao Tzu. Rules for living? Lao Tzu hated rules. And, yeah. and, and if, you, if you were to call the uh, Taoism a religion to Lao Tzu, he would have laughed at you. He would yeah, have nothing to do with it. because it's not a religion. It had nothing to do with religion. He had anything that had to do with, with, with rules of conduct and how to run your life. What he said about rules and laws and so on is that if you need rules, and you need laws in order to be a moral person, then you're not connected to the Tao. I know, but when I read that, I thought, well, oh, my God, we're going to have anarchy. We'd be craziness. It'd be heresy it would be if we don't have rules. The anchor of the universe is located in every single one of us. Your children know what to do. One of my favorite things yes. to say to my children always was, when they would ask, should I do this? What, should I do? what time should I come in? But my re favorite response always was, you know what to do. You know within you the right thing to do. You know whether or not this is that you should come in this late or that late. You know whether you should eat that or not eat that. You don't need me to tell you that. It's about non-interference. It's about seeing the anchor of the universe is located in every one of us. I'm not talking about there wouldn't be there would be anarchy if some of us read it and then others don't read it and then they begin to uh, you know right, impose right, it right, on other right. people. But if everyone understood that there's no concept of enemy, that we all come from the same place, and the 40th verse of the Tao it says that. That the, the way of Tao is a return trip. We are all coming back. You know, T.S. Yeah. Eliot's favorite, famous line about, you know, we shall not cease from exploration. But at the end of all of our exploring will be to return to the place from which we originated and to know it for the first time. To know it for the first time. To know that you came from a place uh -huh. that has no beginnings and no ends, that is infinite, that has no boundaries, that is just is. And that's you know, it's like you're doing nothing. You're doing nothing. You're being done. Let yourself be done in the way that God designed you to be or the Tao designed you to be. Okay. So 
All right. So how do you describe what it is? Because people need... You don't. You don't, you don't get to. You, you don't, don't get, get to it. Mm -mm. You don't get to Because that's the opening line of the Tao, the very first verse of the Tao. Tao the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. You, as soon as you put a label on it, and Kierkegaard, the famous Danish theologian, said, once you label me, yeah. you negate me. I no longer am Kierkegaard, me. Yeah. 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 Once you label, once you put a label on me, I am a woman. You yeah. know, I am black. I am white. I am tall. I am Catholic. I am Muslim. I... Once you label me, you negate me, and now I must live up to whatever, whatever label, that label is. you have placed on yeah, me. Yeah, what the expectation and, for that label and, is. And, and, and the problem with labeling is that it creates conflict. It mm -hmm. creates something that is and something that isn't. See, our minds are not capable of understanding oneness. And that Tao, that's why in the Tao it says, those who know do not speak. Those who speak do not know. What Lao Tzu was saying there is those who know are connected to oneness. And when you're connected to oneness, you don't need to say anything. You just are. So you spent a year. We need another half hour because we didn't even get into what that year was like. So next week, I want to begin with the moment you decided that you were going to spend the year. Oh, it was when a you great said year. to your uh, uh, your secretary, "I want you to get rid of everything." Mm. I was thinking. It was the day after I turned sixty-five. Everything. 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 Mm. Wow. Mm. All my clothes. All your clothes? I did my PBS special in bare feet. I said, I don't even have any shoes. <laughs> I know. I saw you in the PBS special with no right. shoes on. Right. That's right. I that's because you didn't have any shoes? No, that's not what I <laughs> Welcome back to, to our Soul Series. Dr. Wayne Dyer has agreed to join us for yet another conversation because I couldn't get enough of him. His new book, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. You know, went immediately to the bestsellers. That's always good, isn't it? It's wonderful. When that happens. And so the new book is about living the wisdom of the Tao. And Dr. Dyer was telling us last week that you actually decided that you were going to give up everything, including your shoes, mm -hmm. all your clothes, all your belongings, for a year to live the Tao. But for people who are listening, it's not necessary to give up everything in order to live these principles. No, I don't think you have to. You have to physically uh, give up everything. Yeah. But I think the more of what you own, uh, that owns you, uh, is is a good thing to give away. Right. And I try to live by the eighty twenty rule, which is uh, yes. you know the twenty percent of what you have is what you use, and eighty percent you don't use. So to give as much of that away as you can. Well, one of the reasons I really like this book, and I like have really appreciated so many of your books, beginning with Erroneous Zones, and as I told you. Uh, the Power of Intention is also another one of my favorites. But one of the reasons I like this one so much, uh, Changing Your Thoughts and Changing Your Life, Living the Wisdom of the Tao, well, which is currently on the bestsellers, is about all, all the chapters dividing into living with cooperation, living without sickness, living a God-realized life, living in heaven's net, living by bending, living like water. That was mm. one of my favorites. Water is, see, Lao Tzu is teaching us, find your... God, your source, your spirit, your soul, find it in nature. Find it. Look at how nature acts, you know, and then and then and then replicate that. Think like God thinks. Thinks like the and, yeah. and water and is so giving, so flexible, so it's soft. soft. Uh, it's, yeah. it's the softest thing. It's like it's Lao Tzu again. The softest thing overcomes the hardest thing. Flexibility. The seventy-sixth. You have the book there. The seventy-sixth verse of the Tao is my is is my favorite verse in this book, and it's uh, it, it teaches us. This. Let me. Is it okay if I do yeah, this? Yeah, please do that. 76. Listen to this. A man is born gentle and weak. At his death, he is hard and stiff. All things, including the grass and trees, are soft and pliable in life, dry and brittle in death. Stiffness is thus a companion of death. Flexibility is a companion of life. That's a part of the 76th verse of the Tao Te Ching. Now, he wasn't just saying become stiff or, uh, or become flexible in, in your body. He, he was saying become flexible in your thinking. In your, you know, like, remember the, in the last election? Yeah, was yeah I, read that, I read that, and what I felt when I read that is it's not just in your thinking. It's becoming flexible in, your, in the way you move. When I read that, I felt like it means flexible in all of your movement in your thinking movement mm. in your emotional movement right. in your spiritual movement it means it means being fluid soft. fluid it means yeah, being yeah, gentle yeah. It means in the last election during the debates uh, with John Kerry and yes. George Wood, one of the big things about all this whole thing was uh, flip-flopping 
this yes. whole concept of see a, a rigid think rigid thinking is a thinking you know Emerson said a, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds the idea that someone would believe something and say whatever I believe on Monday on Wednesday you can count on me I'll believe the same regardless of what happens on Tuesday is a scary kind of concept right. you want someone who says you know I believe this on Monday now look what happened on Tuesday I have a whole different point of view here on Wednesday. That's not flip-flopping. That's living the Tao. That's, that's how the universe works. It, it asks you to be soft, to be gentle, to understand that water is that great symbol of that. It, it flow, if, if you can, in your relationships, whoever you are, whatever relationship, if you can just become like water, you can enter into any place in your partner's life mentally yeah. by being water wow. because it just go it, it just enters every opening it'll em you know and you can become one with okay. that person all by right being all right water. all right i don't want to run out of time <laughs> again because last week i wanted to to talk to you about what that year was like because I, in case you're just tuning in i'm joined in the studio today with dr wayne dyer who's written a great new book what is 32nd one um called change your thoughts change your life living the wisdom of the Tao. and for one solid year he lived the Tao, gave up everything, all of his worldly possessions, including shoes. I keep coming mm -hmm. back to shoes because hard to live without shoes. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I could be naked, but I need shoes. <laughs> you need shoes. <laughs> <laughs> what about all my Jimmy shoes? Oh, my goodness. When I read that, I was thinking, okay, I would give up everything? Everything. Mm -hmm. And what was that like? Okay, you tell your secretary, give up everything. She's selling, not even selling everything. You say, give it all away. I'm not I even interested in making way. money. And then, how did you begin this process of living the Tao? So you'd read the verses, you'd studied. Did mm -hmm. you study all the 14,000 different no, I took, versions? I took uh, the version that's in, the, the entire Tao Te Ching is in mm -hmm. this book. The, uh, and the, the, it's, my, it's my translation of the Tao. Yes. But I took 10 of the most uh, relevant uh, ones to, to the West, to, to us here in America, to us here in the Western world and combined all of the di different ones and made it this, this version of the Tao Te Ching. So there's now 14,001 translations of the Tao. What I did is I, I, I made a year-long commitment. I started it on January the 1st, 2006, and I read the fir very first verse of the Tao. Mm -hmm. I divided 81, about 81 verses, right? 365 days divided by 81 comes out to about four and a half days for each verse of the Tao. That's what I was going to do. I was going to spend four and a half days on just each one of the verses and at the end of the four and a half days I was going to write an essay a very short essay uh -huh. it only took me maybe two hours to write the essays because I didn't write them over they they wrote them. I wrote I do it by hand because you know in the Tao it teaches you don't want to use machines you don't want a machine to interfere with uh, with your writing so I wrote so when them. you say the essays it means you know living with cooperation living mm. the mystery living all that Each one of those were, were short essays Maybe after each verse after each verse but, but but I spent four days meditating on each of the verses like memorizing them going uh -huh. through them in my mind uh -huh. and then going out where I live on Maui and putting them to work putting them to practice and I can remember um, try, some of them were hard Oprah I mean some of these uh, verses are very hard the, here's the line the Tao does nothing mm -hmm. it leaves nothing undone you know that's like one of the great lines in the Tao Te Ching so how can you do nothing and get and emulate? You're emulating the Tao. You're emulating God, the way God God acts. God, soul, spirit, divine mind, whatever you want to call this organizing intelligence that allows, you know, everything to be. All being comes from non-being. You know, that's right. that's right out of the Bible too. By the way, you know, the the New Testament came 500 years after the Tao. It's loaded with the Tao. Tao it's, uh, it's, yeah. yeah, it's almost all all of that is in there. It's the spirit that gives life. Okay, you know. this is one I like. I was looking for this, the 20th verse. Give up learning, and you will be free right. from all your cares. Now, see, when I read that. I know, that, you read was, that. And but, I thought, oh, how, well, how can I give up learning? Okay, but then continue. What is the difference between yes and no? What is the difference between good and evil? Must I fear what others fear? Should I fear desolation when there is abundance? Should I fear darkness when that light is shining everywhere? In spring, some go to the park and climb the terrace, but I alone am drifting, not knowing where I am, like a newborn babe, before it learns to smile. I am alone without a place to go. Most people have too much. I alone seem to be missing something. Mine is indeed the mind of an ignoramus in its unadulterated simplicity. I am but a guest in this world. While others rush about to get things done, I accept what is offered. I alone seem foolish. 
earning little, spending less. Ah. You know what the, the the perfect example of a of a Taoist master, according to Lao Tzu, is an infant. Has no name, doesn't know its identity, doesn't know its color, it doesn't know its cultural background, it doesn't know how to hate anything. It just is. It just is. It just is. And that's you know, it's like the first nine months of your life. We go right. back to your That's conception. Right. You trusted yeah. God for everything. Everything. You didn't say, oh, my God, I hope I get a nose and I hope it yeah. shows up in the right place. Yes. And I, you just, you, you was total, yes. completely into surrender. Yes. Then you come out, okay, at the ninth month or that you, you pop out and you get surrounded by people who say, that's really good work, God, really good work. We'll take over from here. Yeah. <laughs> and the minute you start taking over from here, what happens is you develop an ego which is where you edge God out, E-G-O, you edge God out, okay? And so now... Oh, I never heard it that <laughs> yeah, way before. Yeah, that right. is so good. Yeah. So you edge God out, and you just push oh, that to the side. Good. And what is this ego? What is it? it I'm going to be quoting you on that. <laughs> it's, it's, it, That's it's an is. idea, Oprah. It's all it is. It's an idea that we carry around. You know what the idea of the ego is? It says, I am what I have. I am what I do. I am what other people think of me. I'm separate from everybody else. I'm separate from what's missing in my life, and I'm separate from God. Those are the six components of the ego, and that's what we're raised on and what we're trained on. Meantime, we showed up here. We didn't have to do a thing. Oh, say that again. I want to say it again. Say it again. Repeat the that The ego. Again. Yeah. The ego is just a collection of ideas that we carry around, okay? I am what I have. I am what I have. So we go around through our whole life, you know, accumulating. Trying as much to as have we can, things. Have more stuff. And then when we don't have any stuff, then we no longer are. We, we, no longer, we lose our identity. I am what I do. I am what I do. Uh, all of my accomplishments. I am what other people think of me. That yes. is, I am my reputation. Those are the three major components of the ego yes. that we spend our life training ourselves to become. I am separate from everybody else. So yes. I am this body, and it looks different than you, so yeah. I'm separate from you. That's right. I'm separate and from... And I can be judgmental of you because I'm better absolutely. than you, and you're not as good as That's I am. That's what the ego is doing. All yeah. the... I'm separate from what's missing in my life. Yes. Now, if you understand that there's no place that the Tao is not, there's no place that God is not, then God has to be in you if there's no place that it's not. And it also has to be in everything that's missing in your life. It has to be if it's every, if there's no place that it's not. So you're already connected to everything that you need in your life, everything that you could possibly want in your life. You're already connected to it. Yeah. All you have to do is align yourself. But there has to be some purpose that the ego must serve. Otherwise, we would have evolved ourselves out of it, don't you think? No. No? Okay. No. I thought that was a good I, question. I, I used to think that. Okay. I, I, I don't think that I'm not as advanced as you are, <laughs> no, okay? No, I think it's uh, the, the ego is not worth defending. And, and and we all spend a lot of our time defending this thing that says, well, you know, I am what I do have, and I have to get more things, and if I don't have as much as they do, then they're going to... And we go through our lives doing all of this stuff, and what it does is it brings us to a point where we no longer have something, or our reputation is gone, or it's taken away from us, or somebody steals it, and what happens to us? Or when we retire, or, you know, any, uh -huh. I no longer can do things, so now people get over a certain age, and they just feel like, you know, I've declined and so on. There's nothing in the DNA that says you have to decline ever in your life. You don't have to decline and your DNA is over 600,000 So then why old. do we have it, though? Why do we have it? We have it because it works. It works at, get, at getting ourselves believing that we're better than other people instead of just allowing ourselves to be free. And that's, it's like, it's like, Taoism, or the Tao teaches us to, like, unpeel the onion, unpeel layers yeah. to get to, the, the essence of the Tao is emptiness getting to that place of emptiness that's like the supreme place to get to where you just empty of all of that and then you're free and then guess what all of the things that you wanted so desperately when you were so ego dom dominated before begin to show up in your life in larger and larger and larger amounts and what do you do with it what does god do with everything that shows up gives it away isn't that what you're doing isn't that what you've learned in your life i mean here you are this world famous icon and what is, what, what is your major lesson? What did I see you doing on uh, 60 Minutes or whatever it was when you were over there in South Africa? Yes. Whatever. Give, 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 give. God, I know why now, why I was given so much. It's, it's about giving. It's about why do you have to wait till you have a lot to learn that? And why don't average, average people out there get that as well? All we have to do is see ourselves in everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, the Native Americans, you want to hear a great quote. The Native Americans said, no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. Uh, wow. you know, think about that. You know, think about it. We are all branches on a tree called humanity. What are we doing fighting each other and yeah. killing each other? What are we doing? Lao Tzu. Because nature is smarter than we are. Absolutely. And it's all about nature. Yeah. It's all about nature. Nature smarter than we yeah. are. So is it possible to, do you think you have your ego? You haven't lost your ego, obviously. No, right? I haven't. Yeah. But 
I'm is, working on it. Is there a way to keep it in check? Is there a way mm. to, yeah, to minimize more. its influence in your life? Every day, just say thank you. Yeah. You know, and it's like, and and get to the place in your life. You know, Rumi had this wonderful line. He said, you know, that to, to practice benevolence, to yeah. just practice being in a place in your life where you are giving. You're just constantly in a state of giving. Okay. You know, sell your cleverness, he said, and purchase. Bewilderment. Bewilder we and, bewilder and just that. go through your life in a state of awe, in a state of bewilderment. Because and everywhere you, you look, there's something to see. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're talking to Dr. Wayne Dyer about living the Tao, living the wisdom of the Tao. It's his latest book on changing your thoughts and changing your life. You believe it's possible for everybody to put their ego in a place where, you know, you know we talk about this, this, this spiritual involvement. And every time I talk to people, uh, some like yourself, people say, well, you know, the, the, the spiritual movement is growing to the, to the point where th there's something happening in the world. And then you look at the world. I mean, I just read uh, something the other day where there are more girls who want to kill themselves now mm -hmm. than ever before. So I wonder, is it just among spiritual folks, people who think mm -hmm. the way you do, that, you know, the world seems to be getting better? Is the world getting better? To me, it is. To me, it is I, because I don't, you know, for every act of evil in the world, mm -hmm. there's a million acts of kindness. So why would you continue to put our attention and our efforts and, and all of our energy on all of the things that are wrong in the world? Yeah. You know, the world is just fine. The world is just fine. Yeah. Yes, there are many, many Isn't things out there. Isn't that what the evening news does? That's oh, why yeah, I just, absolutely. I, can't, I haven't yeah. watched evening and news. And what is it sponsored by? It's sponsored by more and more pills for people to take to overcome all of the anxiety and the stress and the depression of the, of the, and the all the people that all of the things yeah. it's like endless uh, you know amounts of attention on all the things that are wrong and rely upon something outside of yourself to do that all you have to do is become the observer to that you become the witness to that you that isn't that has nothing to do with you and you know one of the great lines in the in the Tao Te Ching speaks about that that any time that you are in battle if you have to go to battle if you have to go to war you don't ever celebrate anybody else ever being killed no matter what you label them whatever label that you put on them you treat everything that happens in battle which we see so much about right. especially these days you know as a funeral as something that uh, rec we recognize within ourselves that we left the Tao because the Tao has no need for us to, there's nothing in what God has offered us that tells us that we have to be in, in competition the other with thing that you say that us. I love so much is about understanding that that principle of Every force is going to create a counterforce, mm. and uh, I, I don't know if I, I can't remember if I read this in the book D or David heard it. David Hawkins spoke about that in yes. Power versus Force. He's yes. a good friend of mine. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Well, all the people I've interviewed are mm. yes, yes, yes. That's good. Well, y'all well, found some that good book dinner here. conversations. <laughs> I found that book, Power versus Force, years ago as a little self-published paperback, and I took it to every lecture I gave really? for four or five years until it became published. Yeah. There was something you said that I'd read in an interview that you I just loved. And I just wanted to quote you on yourself. Um, when you were talking about what you were sharing with us here about the first nine months of your life, how you turned everything over to God, and then you get born, and then your parents say, I'll take it from here. And mm -hmm. yeah, right. where if you'd stayed in the God space, yeah, you'd be different. And then you say, How could you believe that, you're, that you are not worthy of yourself? I just thought, oh my God, I wish more people could hear you say that. Mm. How could you believe that you are not worthy of yourself? Because you and I both, you know, over the years, have talked to thousands and thousands of people. And that seems to be at the core of what so many people don't get, that they are not worthy of themselves. Because, mm. see, when you don't trust in yourself, you're not trusting in the wisdom that created you. That's like an insult to your creator, to the creative yes. process, whatever you want to call that, if you want to call it God. Because, you know, all of us and all the religions that are out there, they all pray to the same God. And then they ask this God, that every, the same God that everybody prays to, to divide itself up and argue against one person or another, you know, or one, yeah. one point of view yeah. or another, when there's only, there's only this oneness. How could that which is perfect, how could that which is divine create something that isn't? You must be like what you came from. You must be. If I gave you a piece of pie from an apple pie, I'd say, what is it? What do you think it's like? You'd say, well, it must be like what it came from. Okay, I'm about to be out of time again. Oh, Can you goodness. tell me what that year did for you? Can you summarize yeah. what that year did for you? Mm -hmm. First of all, I, w I, I look at you and I already think, you know, highly evolved spiritual person being, living your life on a path of, uh, of being able to connect 
to the higher self, mm. knowing your own spirituality, a sense of connectedness to, to the oneness of mm. life. So what, would, what did you need to know in that year that you didn't already know? I, I, I learned how to be joyful everywhere. Mm. I learned to find, I learned to, to be totally at peace. You know what I've learned? I've learned to think like God thinks, as, as close as I can get to thinking like God thinks. So I see myself, I see the unfolding of God in everyone that I meet, and I see myself in that person. Even sitting here now, I see myself in you, and I see you in me. And by being able to do that, there's no way that I could have any hatred or anger or bitterness towards you, or the waiter who doesn't come to me on time, or the flight that is delayed, or whatever's the circumstances that show up in my life. I'm able to see myself in all of those people who are just doing what they can do, and I'm able to be love. And able to be love, that's mm. it. For people who, for whom uh, picking up their first uh, Wayne Dyer book is going to be this book, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, Living the Wisdom of the Tao, you know, for a lot of people at the beginning, it's like overwhelming. It's a lot. Mm. There's a lot to take in. What do you want to say to them? It's so easy. It's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy to be. It's just so easy. It's just like... Who was the guy that said, can't we just learn to get along? Yeah, can't we just it was Rodney King. Yeah, Rodney King. Back can't we then, all just get along can't we just Can't we just love each other? You know, so like when I watch the evening news and I see so many insurgents were killed and so on, I, 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 go, out to, I go out to them, to each and every one of them. You know, I, I find that peace and that love within myself. Wouldn't it be amazing, I was, as I was reading this thinking, as we move into this election year, wouldn't it be amazing to have Dow-centered leadership? Oh, I think of that all the time, Oprah. That's what you know. It's like, and that's coming. That's coming. You know, and and I, and I well, I mean, we we pretty much know who the who, yeah. who who's Dow-centered yeah, and who right. isn't. But right. now yeah. we'll leave that to another it's, time. Yeah, and 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 all of us, all of us have the possibility to make that happen for ourselves. It's going to happen. There's no doubt about it. Listen, I could talk to you forever. Oh, I love you so much. Thank you so I'm much so for the love. Proud of Thank you. you. I'm so happy for you. Thank you, because we've been doing this a while. But no, I, I could talk to you all day. Mm. Maybe we'll do all day with Wayne. Yeah, Dyer. there we go. Yeah, take us a while. <laughs> Thank you for joining me again. Thanks, Oprah. Continued success. Thank you. You're listening to uh, Oprah and Friends. Oprah and Wayne Dyer here, mm. XM 156. Talk to you next week, everybody. My teacher, Abraham Maslow, used to say that to become independent of the good opinion of other people is among the highest qualities of people who reach these levels of, uh, you know, of, of, of higher consciousness or what we're talking about, the, the meaning phase of our life or the afternoon of our life. And most of us get so consumed with what other people think of us. And when Buddha offered that, that quote, when, when his devotee said, how can, you be, how can you be so calm in the face of all that criticism? You know, his answer was that question, you know, it, it, which was, uh, you know, if someone offers you a gift and, and you don't accept that gift, to, to whom does the gift belong? And they all thought about it and then realized that when someone offers you a gift of their opinion, no matter what it is, if you don't accept it, then it doesn't belong to you. And why in the world would you ever be upset about something that belongs to someone else? It's theirs. It's not yours. And that's, that's something that each and every one of us can cultivate. And, you know, it, it, it goes way beyond just uh, that great spiritual t story. It goes into when we put our focus on uh, how much money am I making or how much prestige do I have or did I get that promotion or did I win the game? You know, all of that is really about being uh, dependent upon the good opinion of other people. You ever watch television and see you know, when the football uh, game is on and the, uh, the cameras pan the crowd and everybody's one, number one, number one, and I think... You know, only one person can be number one. Hmm. You know, only one. And but there's all of us out there. So even in the even in a, co a competitive tennis match and or whatever it might be that you're doing, there's still the, the the place within you where you can you can allow other people's opinions to be just what they are, and to just enjoy every single moment of it. Just recently, in, a, in an Olympic match, there was a high hurdler who was running for the gold medal. And when she got to the ninth hurdle, there's ten hurdles, when she got to the ninth hurdle, she said in her interview afterwards, I already saw the gold medal uh, around my neck. And as soon as she took her focus off of, the, off of what she was there to do and onto the, the outcome or what other people were going to think of her and what it was going to be like to stand on the podium, she hit the hurdle. And she hadn't hit a hurdle in years. Uh, if we stay on purpose, on process, rather than on what people think and what the outcome is going to be, nothing can stop us. Nothing. 
Carl Jung once said that uh, at the same moment that you're a protagonist in your own life and you're making choices, at the very same moment you're also the spear carrier or the extra in a much larger drama. You know, we, we are making choices, he said, but we are all doomed to make choices, which is a paradox. You know, we're doomed, that is, it's all set up for us, and we're also making choices. And you, if you want to get to the highest place in the Bhagavad Gita, the great ancient spiritual text of the, of the, of the Hindu faith, you know, the, the Bhagavad Gita teaches us, that, that means Song of the Lord, it teaches us that you have to learn to blend the two opposites and live with two opposite ideas at the same time. I am a choice maker, I am out there, I have a free will, and at the same time, I am being lived by the Tao. And both of those, while they may counter, they may contradict each other, it's the way of life, because what doesn't contradict? Think about who you are. Think about who you are right now, listening to this. Who you are is this thing that's in physical form. It has a beginning, it has an end, it has substance to it, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can get a hold of it. And also who you are is totally and completely invisible. That part of you which is listening to this and processing this and thinking about it and wondering about it is invisible. It has no form. You are form and formless all at the same moment. If I want to just wiggle my finger, it's, an, it's, just, it's an amazing thing to be able to just take this finger and wiggle it because here's the finger and I wiggle it. What makes it wiggle it? You know, you can go inside of my brain and you can find, you know, that, that which allows it to happen, but you can never find the interior, the, the invisibleness within each and every one of us that just says, I'm going to wiggle my finger. That's just a thought. It's invisible. You can't get a hold of that. You can't grab that thought. So I am that, and I am also the finger that is wiggling. I'm both. And that paradox is something we all have to learn to live with and stop fighting it. It's just in the way of things. You want the truth of who you believe you are to mesh with what you're projecting outward. If this is unsuccessful, you're aware of it, even if you opt to ignore it. The imbalanced surfaces in your daily interactions showing up in feelings of being upset, out of sorts, confused, and often misunderstood. My intentions are good, so why is it that no one else sees it this way? And I try to be a good employee, a good father, a good citizen, and a good husband, but I always seem to be misconstrued or misjudged. This results in a continual state of frustration and even anger. You need to make a decision to realign yourself on an energetic basis to get the scales balanced between your idealized self and your realized self, as perceived by the majority of people in your life. Restoring the balance through realignment. When you balance the way you want to be with the way you're being received, there's a distinctly pleasurable feeling of being in harmony with life. It's not that you're seeking approval or groveling for respect or love. It's more that, well, it's more that you're in the world in a way that's congruent with your inner desires to be the kind of person you are. You accomplish this by first noticing when you're feeling misperceived, then determining if your words and actions match the truth of your inner thoughts. This alignment check will eventually and almost automatically give you a reading that compares what you're projecting outwardly with what you're inwardly wanting to express. Let's take a look at some of these indices. This alignment check calls for self-honesty along with a willingness to experience radical humility in the process. 1. I am a loving human being. If you both desire and believe this to be true about yourself, then you're two-thirds of the way toward being in balance on this principle. Your desire to be a loving person and at the same time your truth that you are a loving person leaves only the third element, how others perceive you. Here are some ways of being that are counterproductive to being perceived as a loving human being and create an imbalance. Having a strong position of hatred toward anyone or any group of people, you're out of balance. Violence in any form, including aggressive verbal outbursts, you're out of balance. Support for weapons designed to produce megadeath explosions, you're out of balance. You enjoy being entertained by films portraying hatred and killing, you're out of balance. Verbally belittling others' beliefs and insisting that your beliefs are superior, you're out of balance. Let your thoughts of love become the driving force behind your unloving behaviors. This is true alignment. Begin looking at the world as a vast mirror reflecting back to you exactly what you are. If you truly are a loving human being, the world will look like a loving place to you, and this will be how you will be perceived. 
you will have restored balance, and consequently, there will be no discrepancy between how you see yourself and what the world is reflecting back to you. If the world continues to look like an unloving and unlivable place, I urge you to keep examining the kind of energy that you're projecting outward. 2. I am a kind human being. You cannot be kind to me and unkind to your waiter and be in balance. When you persistently extend arrogance outward in the direction of other people, even if you feel justified in your actions, that's how you're perceived and defined. You need to know that you're not coming across as a balanced, kind person. You may indeed exemplify kindness in how you treat your children and your grandmother, and even all of the children and all of the grandmothers of the world. But if you honk your horn in a red-faced anger at a slow-driving grandmother who's taking her grandchildren to school, then you're way, way, way out of balance. If you see yourself as desirous of being a kind person, then consciously spend time daily aligning your thoughts with your desire. The universe will cooperate, bringing you more and more of that same kindness. 3. I am a joyful, happy human being. In this category, your feelings are the measurement you need to pay attention to. In fact, they require your undivided attention. Do you feel happy and content, or are you easily outraged over the misconduct of others? Does your joy turn quickly to despair when you read the newspapers or listen to the news? Do people around you really think that you're a happy camper in your daily life? Do you regularly hear others telling you to lighten up or chill out and stop letting yourself get so worked up? These are clues indicating the balance or imbalance between how you see yourself and what you project to others. The alignment check for this principle involves noticing your feelings and your ability to sustain them, along with feedback from people you trust. And four, I am a non-judgmental human being. If you're truly non-judgmental, then it will be impossible for you to categorize or generalize individuals into groups such as old, southern, uneducated, teeny boppers, belonging to red or blue states, conservatives, liberals, and so on. A stereotype is a judgment. You cannot be non-judgmental and be critical of the different ways people talk or eat or dress, socialize, dance, or anything else. If you believe that you're non-judgmental but admit that you have a tendency to generalize and criticize, then you're out of balance. You're due for a realignment so that your current thoughts and ultimately your behaviors will become a vibrational match to your inner self-portrait. Make a conscious decision to look for what is right and pleasing in others. Create a new habit of complimenting those around you. Decide that you're going to disregard stereotypes and refuse to engage in conversations that dwell on judging anyone. Turn judgments into blessings to restore the imbalance between how you want to be and how you're actually presenting yourself to the world. Rebalance this energy by sending a silent blessing to the person. On the non-judgmental side of the balance scale, think about how much love and support this person could use. I guarantee that you'll feel the difference internally and at the same time feel more compassionately connected to that individual. The energy of non-judgment is totally balanced as opposed to the energy of contempt, pity, or some other negative option. Become aware of all of your behaviors and feelings. Then attempt to determine if they match your vision of yourself and if that self-image is what others see. You'll immediately feel discord when you discover imbalance, and that's when you can choose to change habits to match your desires and restore equilibrium to your life. I've adopted the following list from a fascinating book called The Disappearance of the Universe, published by Hay House in 2004 by Gary Renard, which gives an account of two spiritual visitors teaching Gary the significance of A Course in Miracles. Whether you accept the premise or not is your option. I find these teachings to be profound, and they merit consideration. Number one, the ego says, you're a body. The Holy Spirit says, you're not even a person. You're just like me, your source of being. This teaching shows that our ego insists we're impermanent, which is opposed to our being what Lao Tzu taught, that which never changes. That's what we are, that which never changes. Lao Tzu was a 6th century B.C. mystical spiritual teacher and author of the Tao. When we think about our life here on earth, we can't avoid the awareness that everything we experience, including our body, returns to dust to be recycled by spirit. Our ego finds this concept impossible to accept. 2. The ego says your thoughts are very, very important. The Holy Spirit insists only thoughts you think with God are real. Nothing else matters. 
This teaching explains that thoughts centering on ourselves, appearance, possessions, fears, or relationship problems are not only unimportant, they're not real. Ouch! The ego flinches at such commentary. But if we examine these thoughts from spirit's infinite perspective, we see that we're indeed unreal. When we're totally immersed in spirit, we only had thoughts of spirit because that's all we were. When we left it behind, we opted for thoughts that our ego told us were important. Of course, in Miracles tells us that we didn't even have to think in heaven because we were thought by God. So we can access permanent inspiration by letting ourselves once again be thought by God and achieve a state of heaven on earth. 3. Your ego says, The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. The Holy Spirit asserts, God only gives and never takes away. When living an inspired life, we're focused on giving our life away and simultaneously observing how it's returned, thus fortifying the idea of what goes around comes around. Ego is constantly telling us to be fearful about losing what we have and warning us of greedy others who will take what's ours. But God doesn't take away from us. As we learn to think this way, we attract more of what's missing in our life. The reason for this is simple. We become what we think about. If we think about giving, like God does, the universe will provide. If we think about things being taken away, then that's what we'll attract. 4. The ego says, there's good and bad. The Holy Spirit maintains, there's nothing to judge because it isn't real in the first place. When we accept the ego identification card, we agree to judge almost everyone and everything in terms of good or bad. The problem with this is that we all contain the same spirit from which we originated. If I make you bad and myself good, for instance, I deny the presence of spirit in you whom I elected to judge. God sees it quite differently. Our spiritual source knows that only it is real. All of the ephemeral world of form and boundaries is not of its infinite nature. At our core, the place where we all originated from and returned to, there's no one and nothing to judge. This takes some time to get used to, but once we grasp the truth of this observation, we're free to tap into authentic inspiration. 5. The ego directs love and hate toward individuals. The Holy Spirit's love is nonspecific and all-encompassing. Ego directs us to love some, be indifferent toward many, and hate all others. When we learn to be back in spirit on a full-time basis, we discover what we knew in our pre-ego time. There's no they. There's only one. The one source of all-encompassing love knows nothing of boundaries, differing customs, geographic divisions, family splits, or differences in race, creed, sex, and so on. It only knows love for all. Jesus points so perfectly to the differences between ego and spirit. When we were in spirit, we were a child of our Father in heaven. And, quote, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. Matthew 5.45. This, of course, means that it's all one. Evil, good, righteous, and unrighteous are all the same. Some move away from the Father and some move toward him. This is such an important and powerful lesson to get as we move toward becoming inspired by living in spirit. 6. The ego devises clever reasons why we should continue to listen to its selfish counsel. The Holy Spirit is certain that at some point we'll turn toward it and ultimately return. Ego will tout its irresistible logic to assure us that our body, our possessions, and our achievements are all very real and important. It convinces us by insisting that what's real is what we can see, touch, hear, taste, and smell. Therefore, invisible spirit isn't real. So ego continues to be attached to stuff and to make the acquisition of money and power a lifelong objective. To that end, it wants us to disdain forgiveness in favor of seeking revenge. Very persuasive logic when we look around and see almost everyone doing just that. Through the lens of inspiration, however, we're able to see how ego has distorted the message of the Holy Spirit. Instead of seeking revenge, we're more likely to see a very sad nation of strivers and virtually no arrivers, a gaggle of pill poppers searching outside of themselves for a resolution to their depressing, anxiety-filled, joyless, and often lonely lives. As we return to the Holy Spirit, we'll no longer be under the influence of ego's absurd counsel. And seven, the ego wants us to regret our past. The Holy Spirit wants us to practice unconditional forgiveness. 
The Holy Spirit isn't limited by a past or a future. There's only the eternal now. Any energy we place on what transpired in the past is groundwork for guilt, and ego loves guilt. Such negative energy fabricates an excuse for why our present moments are troubled and gives us a cop-out, a reason to stay out of spirit. And thinking about what we've been or what we did wrong in the past are great impediments to an inspired life. On the other hand, when we're inspired, we're totally engaged in the now. In an infinite, never-beginning, and never-ending universe, there can be no past. All guilt and regret simply serve as ways to avoid being here in the only moment we have, which is now. This is where we reconnect to spirit, now. If we choose to use up this holy instant with regrets about a past that's only an illusory thought, then we're unable to be in the joyful, loving, peaceful present moment. Cramming this holy moment with thoughts of guilt, remorse, and regret is great for ego, and keeps us totally resistant to being in spirit. These seven messages are the dominant ones the ego drones on about. If we don't listen, it will try to drown out inspiration by intensifying worrisome and fearful thoughts. I've managed to tame this annoying voice of the ego so that its influence is almost negligible in my life. What follows is a guide for shifting your mindset to experiencing a world where real magic is not only possible, but it's your birthright. With this shift, Miracle-making will become something you not only believe in, but that you manifest in your everyday life. Number one, reserve your judgment and your disbelief. I encourage you to cultivate a new, self-declared openness to anything and everything being a possibility for you. Having an open mind and suspending your disbelief allows you to experience new vistas, while your closed mind keeps you trapped in your old ways of thinking and seeing. Real magic is only available to those who can imagine any and all possibilities while letting the how it will happen take care of itself. Two, create a real magic zone in your mind. Make this a very private part of your life. Reserve a small piece of your consciousness exclusively for this. I've been able to manifest what constitutes miracles for myself by having this very private zone all to myself. Retreat there often to ask for the loving guidance and the guidance will be there. Number three, affirm yourself as a no-limit person. When you develop this real magic zone in your mind and trust that you can go there at will, begin to affirm to yourself that there are literally no limits to the powers that you possess. A great rule of thumb is this. If you can conceive of it in your mind, then it can be brought into the physical world. To become your own miracle worker, you'll have to change the thoughts that create your world of limits and boundaries. Why not include the presence of real magic in your life as well? Number four, develop a new mindset toward the concept of intuition. You really must become comfortable with the idea that strong inner pleadings and sudden hunches are truly inner voices offering you guidance. Think of your intuitive self as God talking privately to you, just as you talk privately to God and call it prayer. I'm absolutely certain that you have numerous stories of times that an inner voice prompted you to behave in what seemed to be an irrational way and turned out instead to be life-saving. It happens to everyone. Most of us get these intuitive signals on a regular basis. Your intuition, that fuzzy inner voice that you hear so often, is a part of your life. It's there. It's real. Pay attention to it. Number five. Discover the secret that sits in the center and knows. Become familiar and comfortable with the notion that nothingness has something to offer you on your path to real magic. Consider, it's the space between the notes that makes the music. A note without space is one long sound. No nothingness, no music. Consider this, a room is not a room without silent, empty space within, surrounded by the shape of material form. No nothingness, no room. And so it is with you. You too are material form surrounding the invisible, silent emptiness that is also you. Without that nothingness inside, there can be no you. It is out of that secret in the center that you will be able to create miracles for yourself. Number six, learn to learn through knowing and trusting rather than doubting and fearing. Much of your learning has likely involved questioning your ability to gain a particular skill. You were taught to doubt in a culture that stressed you can't. It's wrong. You don't have the right background or the right credentials or the training or the experience. 
Out of doubt came a fear of your greatness, a fear of disapproval, a fear of failure or intimacy, and even success. If you want to become acquainted with real magic, fear and doubt must be replaced with trust and a strong reliance on internal knowing. Keep in mind as you shift to this new consciousness that behind fear is powerlessness. That which you fear you are fighting, and fighting always weakens you. Behind trust is empowerment and love. It is your choice always, and the choice begins in that amorphous inner world of the mind. Number seven, affirm that your intention creates your reality. Memorize and continually remind yourself, my intention creates my reality. Intention is the energy of your soul coming into contact with your physical reality. What you see around you, who you associate with, how you function daily, and virtually everything about the physical you is a result of your intentions or how your thoughts became energized into action. Creating miracles in your life comes from your intention to do so. Not your wish, not your desire, not your goal. Your intention. Then and only then, you'll begin to turn that same potential into your reality in the material world. Number eight. Experience surrender and satori. Surrendering is the equivalent of putting inspiration into your life. When you are inspired, you feel purposeful. When you trust in the invisible intelligence of the universe, you feel guided. It can happen in a moment, and it often occurs just that quickly. In Zen, they call this process satori, which translates roughly to instant awakening. This feeling of satori is a result of an inner decision to be at harmony with yourself and your physical world. It's really a decision to surrender. Number nine. Learn to act as if the life you visualize is already here. Act as if that which you perceive in your mind is already here in the physical world. You create your thoughts. Your thoughts create your intentions. Your intentions create your reality. Consequently, you must begin to ignore your own doubt about the importance of your inner world and start acting as if the images you desire are already your reality. If you want to be confident but don't normally act that way, today, just this once, act in the physical world the way that you believe a confident person would. This is how miracle-minded people really act in their lives. Try it. Number 10. Live according to your spiritual self first and your physical self second. In developing your mindset for real magic, you must begin the process of living primarily according to your spiritual self. Miracles will only occur if the choices you are making are in concert with your spiritual self. Your first responsibility is to your spiritual side. Consult your mind before acting, and therefore become authentic to yourself. It is nothing more than an internal shift. There is no need to rid yourself of physical habits nor pretend that your physical longings don't exist. Instead, what you do is you rearrange your priorities, making first contact with your soul, paying attention to it first, and allowing your behaviors in the physical world to flow from those new thoughts. Look within and listen, and your priorities will be clearly seen and heard by your physical self. It can be difficult to finally just lighten up and understand that life is what happens while you're making other plans. This is it. Each and every instant of your life takes place in the present moment. Using your present moments to chase after future moments is an ego-based activity. When you are finally able to say that you have arrived, you will know what it feels like to be free. Your higher self does not want you to be lazy or without purpose, but to realize the power in knowing that you have arrived. When you know that this moment is your entire life, you are not focused on past or future moments, and you release the stress and tension that accompanied the striving lifestyle. With that release, you become more productive and peaceful than you were when you looked behind or ahead of yourself and did not allow your mind to rest in the still center of the present moment. Being fully in the now means that you will experience heaven on earth because you are completely absorbed in the soul of the holy instant. To experience the bliss of knowing that you are here now in this moment and that is all there needs to be, all there ever was and all you will ever know, you must learn to trust your higher self and let go of those ingrained teachings from all the egos that have influenced your life up until now. You will begin to realize that you are not on trial in the now here. You will soon realize that your mission is to serve and extend the love that is your basic essence, period. You don't have to do more, even though you may choose to do a great deal. Your overriding objective is to stay focused on sending and receiving agape, 
the love of God. If you incorporate the following ideas into the practice of your daily mission, you will succeed in your objective. Nothingness. Nothingness has a very positive value in your life. It is out of nothing that all is created. Space is considered to be nothing, no particles, no form, so we describe it as nothing. To fear this empty space or to deny its value as a part of us means doubting our own existence. We came from nothingness, the nowhere I've described throughout this tape, to this world of form, the now here. Surrender. To understand the concept of surrendering, you will not be able to rely on your ego. Ego never wants you to even consider surrendering. It would much rather you hang on to the belief that you must strive and cling to the familiar way. The notion of being attached to what happened to you in the past can be very deeply ingrained in you by your false self. You must learn to recognize ego's attachment to the past when it uses this to keep you stuck in striving. Surrender the belief that your past is what is driving your present. Surrendering also means learning to recognize the signals from your higher self that something within you needs to be witnessed. This means surrendering to whatever is in the present moments of your life. For many people, it can be confusing to discern whether it is ego or spirit that is at the helm. I find that using the image of a boat moving along the surface of a lake is helpful in making the distinction between ego and higher self. I visualize the wake of the boat as a symbol of the past. The wake is not driving the boat, it is merely the trail that is being left behind by the present moment movements of my boat image. What drives the boat is the energy generated in the now. I do not credit or blame the past for the boat's present state of arriving in this spot on the lake. That past cannot drive you in this now, and that past needn't be held responsible for the boat's problems. Practice surrendering by creating a new agreement with now. Agree to know that your past is a trail of present moments that are all left behind, and at the same time, know that if you are having difficulty in this present moment, you will surrender to that reality. Surrendering invites your loving presence to be available in every now moment. What a pleasure each moment can then be, even the last moment. Acceptance Once when I was asked to define enlightenment, the best I could come up with was the quiet acceptance of what is. I believe that truly enlightened beings are those who refuse to allow themselves to be distressed over things that simply are the way they are. To arrive rather than to strive means applying the wisdom of Reinhold Niebuhr's so-called serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Knowing the difference can be the most difficult part. There is an ancient Zen teaching that says if you understand, things are just as they are. If you do not understand, things are just as they are. This is the essence of acceptance and the way of arriving rather than striving. Bewilderment Your physical being is an enormous miracle. Its thousands of working parts function with a divine organizing intelligence. Consider your blood circulation, air inhalation, and oxygenation, your eyes, muscles, and bones, all responding to a brain and nervous system that is beyond comprehension. There are miles of arteries and veins, intestines with infinitely tiny microbes, all working in unison with that divine intelligence that creates the body you occupy. To be in a state of bewilderment, stop and behold the wonder of you. Allow yourself to enjoy the bewilderment and awe of who and what you are. There is the miraculous machine that houses you, and there is the incomprehensible mystery of the ghost in the machine that is your mind and soul observing all. Patience our loving presence offers us the infinite patience that originates with God. It has taken me over 50 years to know many of the concepts I have talked about on this tape. God has been patient. I have done things in my life that today make me shudder in contempt, yet God somehow stuck it out with me, patiently seeing the potential for something grander. I have stolen and shoplifted in my earlier days, lied all too frequently, been promiscuous and unfaithful, used substances, and through all this and much, much more, God showed me her infinite patience. The stories of the lives of St. Paul and St. Francis of Assisi describe the same kind of patience. This infinite patience is available to you at all moments. Regardless of where you have been, how you have lived, or how much you have relied upon your false self, God's infinite patience is ever-present. One of the great teachers in my life was Paramahansa Yogananda, 
a man who came out of India to teach the ways of the higher self to the people of the West. I've read many of his speeches and have found great comfort in his writings as well as reading about his life. I offer you one of my favorite sayings to ponder as you move toward an awareness of arriving rather than striving. Seek spiritual riches within, he reminds us. What you are is much greater than anyone or anything else you have ever yearned for. That is the voice of your higher self reminding you to quietly accept yourself and turn off the yearning. You are never going to get it all. You are it all already. Someone just sent me recently a, uh, a video that said the Steve Jobs top 10 uh, seek, uh, rules for success, you know. Um, and I went through, I went through the whole thing. It was about a 40 minute video and I just started watching it. It was various um, times that Steve Jobs had been, interdu- had been uh, in- interviewed and um, they went through his various su- success themes. And I think this story just summarizes about all 10 of them. It's called uh, Why Do Ducks Quack and Eagles Fly? Years ago, this is in the, in the Manila paper. Years ago, my friend Harvey McKay told me a wonderful story about a cab driver that proved this point. He was waiting in line for a ride at the airport. When a cab pulled up, the first thing Harvey noticed was that the taxi was polished to a bright shine. Smartly dressed in a white shirt and black tie and freshly pressed black slacks, the cab driver jumped out and rounded the car to open the back passenger door for me. Uh, he handed my friend a laminated card and said, I'm Wally, I'm your driver. While I'm loading your bags in the trunk, I'd like you to read my mission statement. Taken aback, Harvey read the card. It said, Wally's mission statement. Quote, to get my customers to their destination destination in the quickest, safest, and cheapest way possible in a friendly environment. Unquote. This blew Harvey away, especially when he noticed that the inside of the car matched the outside spotlessly clean. As he slid behind the wheel, Wally said, Uh, Would you like a cup of coffee? I have a thermos of regular and one of decaf. My friend said jokingly, no, I prefer, I'd rather prefer a soft drink. Wally smiled and said, no problem. I have a cooler up here in front with regular and Diet Coke, water and orange juice. Almost stuttering, Harvey said, I'll take a Diet Coke. Handing him his drink, Wally said, if you'd like something to read, I have the Wall Street Journal, I have Time, Sports Illustrated, and USA Today. As they were pulling away, Wally handed my friend another laminated card. These are the stations I get and the music they play, if you'd like to listen to the radio. As if that weren't enough, Wally told Harvey that he had the air conditioning on and asked if the temperature was comfortable for him. Then he advised Harvey of the best route to his destination for that time of day. He also let him know that he'd be happy to chat and tell him about some of the sights, or, if Harvey preferred, to leave him with his own thoughts. Tell me, Wally, my amazed friend asked the driver, have you ever, have you always served customers like this? Wally smiled into the rearview mirror. No, not always. In fact, it's only been in the last two years. My first five years driving, I spent most of my time complaining, like all the rest of the cabbies do. Then I heard this personal growth guru, Wayne Dyer, on the radio one day. He had just written a book called You'll See It When You Believe It. Dyer said that if you get up in the morning expecting to have a bad day, you'll rarely disappoint yourself. He said, stop complaining, differentiate yourself from your competition. Don't be a duck, be an eagle. Ducks quack and complain, eagles soar above the crowd. That hit me right between the eyes, said Wally. Dyer was really talking about me. I was always quacking and complaining, so I decided to change my attitude and become an eagle. I looked around at the other cabs and their drivers. The cabs were dirty, the drivers were unfriendly, and the customers were unhappy. So I decided to make some changes. I put in a few more at a time. When, <clears throat> when my customers responded well, I did more. I take it that it's paid off for you, Harvey said. It sure has, Wally replied. My first year as an eagle, I doubled my income from the previous year. This year, I'll probably quadruple it. You were lucky to get me today. I don't sit at cab stands anymore. My customers call me for appointments on my cell phone or leave a message on my answering machine. If I can't pick them up myself, I get a reliable cabbie friend to do it, and I take a piece of the action. Wally was phenomenal. He was running a limo service out of a yellow cab. I've probably told that story to more than 50 cab drivers over the years, and only two took the idea and ran with it. 
Whenever I go to their cities, I give them a call. The rest of the drivers quacked like ducks and told me all the reasons they couldn't do any of what I was suggesting. Wally, the cab driver, made a different choice. He decided to stop quacking like ducks and start soaring like eagles. No one can make you serve customers well. You make that choice. That's because great service is a choice. And that the end of the story says, I hope that this story will serve as a motivation, not only for our <coughs> advocates, but also for people to look at things differently and make a choice to succeed in spite of everyday problems in life. Isn't that a great story? I love that. I'd like to give that to a couple of waiters I've had recently. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that weren't very happy to be where they were. Well, you know, it's applicable to virtually everything. You don't even have to be out there working. It's it's applicable to how you how you how you run your family and how you run your home and uh, you know how you go shopping. Virtually anything that you do, and in, including I mean, how you keep your own car and uh, and your own home and everything else. It's like you, if you change the way you look at it, you know. And and what he did is he just he heard this. I used to give this talk called Ducks and Eagles. This goes back many many years. Um, uh, and, and I would talk about how eagles soar above the crowd and all of that, and ducks kind of just uh, quack around and lay on the, or, you know, always on the ground, and they're always stepping in their own on their own duck shit and, and, and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and eagles just had to soar above all of that, and uh, and, and learning how to be, uh, you know, how to change your attitude towards virtually everything that you do. What a great lesson in that! The idea that you you, know, you take, you know, there's a rule. It's called the 80-20 rule. And in the 80-20 rule, it says um, everything that you have, all of your stuff, 20% of it is what you use. All of your clothes in your closet, 20%. You just keep using the same 20% over and over. 80% of the clothing that you have in your, in your closet for so many people is something that you never use, you don't wear. You look at it, you store it, you think, well, there might come a day, oh, I can't part with that, even though you've been carting it around every time you move, you move it and you put it. <laughs> Take the 80% that you don't use, says Lao Tzu, and give it away, give it away. Lao Tzu said that when your cup is full, stop pouring. When your cup is full, stop pouring. We have an obesity crisis in the, in the United States, in the Western world. The obesity crisis can be handled if you just read the Tao. If you realize, in verse 33, it says, if you realize you have enough, you are truly rich. If you could just learn something called portion control, where you just take a bite and you say, is my cup full? Stop pouring. Stop pouring. In other words, instead of filling yourself with with that which is already a surplus and the Tao it teaches us to take surpluses and to reduce them and to take deficiencies and increase them so that we create balance in our lives to be in balance you can take the jewelry that you don't use you can take the clothing that, and then once you've given away the the, the eighty percent that you don't use take one of the things that you really like <laughs> and practice giving that away it's such a wonderful way Listen to this poem. It was written by a, a great Persian poet named Hafiz. He says, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. <laughs> Just look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. It lights up the whole sky. There's no owing. There's no owing. You don't have to be, you can practice living in a state of contentment. This was so powerful for me. You, you just can't imagine how good it felt for one entire year to walk through every day and say, I'm content. I'm content. So I start out every morning of my life. The first words, Hafiz says, if there's only one prayer that you say every day, make it thank you. Just say thank you. That's how I start. Wake up. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Source. Thank you, Tao. Whatever you want to call. The opening line of the Tao says, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. As soon as you put a name on it, it dissolves. There's no name for it. It's just endlessly, invisibly, constantly in a state of creating, out of a state of love. I ask if I could have water. 
on the on the stage. They did it. They figured it out. There's a, a now, I'm going to try to get some of this water, okay? So you get down here and you just, that's, I'm going to just scoop this up. And I, okay, now the tighter you hold it, the less chance you have of doing anything with it, isn't it? How can I experience water? The way to experience water is to just get soft, just get un unbending. And there it is. That's what water is. The minute I grasp it, the minute I try, and Lao Tzu is saying, the same thing is true in everything in your life. The more you grasp, the more you try to hold on to it, the more you try to be rigid with it, the less control you have of it. The softer you are, the less rigid you are, the more flexible you are as a person, the more you can accomplish. In reading the Seth material, Jane Roberts said that we are awake at the wrong time and asleep at the wrong time that the best time to be awake is between 3 and 6 a.m., wherever you are. And that, she said, virtually every single one of you, and I'd like to put you to this test, every one of you will receive a wake-up call from God between 3 and 6 a.m. You will wake up for a moment, note the time, and then listen to your ego and go back to sleep. <laughs> or maybe get up if you got a prostate problem <laughs> and get right back into bed and say, well, it's 3.30, I don't get up at 3.30 in the morning. Only a fool would do that, you see. And that the best time to be asleep is between 3 and 6 in the afternoon. And that between 3 and 6 in the morning is when the world is silent. And you will, and, and I've learned this after six, seven months of doing this, I've learned that um, I am the most clear in these hours. And I have begun to have this awareness after six months now of, uh, of being up in these hours that, um, that I am losing the paradigm that I was stuck in. And the paradigm that I was stuck in says if you don't get enough sleep you're going to be very tired for the rest of the day. And I've only had, let me see, to tell, let me see how fit I am and how good I feel. Where's my watch? Where's the clock? I've got to find out, well let's see, I went to bed at 11, 11, 12, 4 hours it's going to be a deficit of four hours, so I'm not going to, I'm going to be sleepy all the rest of the day, and then I'm not going to get this done, and tonight we've got to go here, and I'm going to be sleepy then. I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> now, there was an ancient Sufi poet. His name was Rumi. And Rumi had, in one of his poems, he said, Do not go back to sleep. Do not go back to sleep. Do not go back to sleep. So what I have done, and what my teacher said to me, he said, You will find this difficult at first because your ego will be telling you all the reasons why this is absurd. So what you do is you wake up and you put your feet on the floor. And then if you want to go back to sleep, sleep with your feet on the floor. <laughs> Which I have done on a few occasions. <laughs> but not for very long. And the ironic thing about all of this is that I now, when I go to sleep, it doesn't make any difference what time it is, I can't wait for three or four o'clock in the morning to arrive and to get out there and B, and what, no matter what the temperature is or what city I'm in or where I am, it, I can't wait for that. And I have eradicated fear from my consciousness. It's just like knowing that I'm, I'm protected and that I'm fine and that it's going to be all right. And so I would just like throw that out to you. There are probably people in the room here who get up in those hours, not to go to work, but often to meditate or to write or to do, uh, to do their music or to, uh, to create whatever it is that you're creating or to think through whatever. To me All of, this is a very, very spiritual time of the day. It is the most spiritual time of the day. It is the time when you have more silence. And as Melville said, silence is God's one and only voice. And you will begin to make a direct side of communication with the higher part of yourself if you can remove so many of the distractions.